you already resemble the votary of the Lotus Sutra, just as a monkey resembles a man or as a rice cake resembles the moon. Because you so earnestly protected the people of Atsahara, the people of this country consider you to be a traitor, like Masakado of the Shohei era or Sadato of the Tengi era. This is solely because you have committed your life to the Lotus Sutra. Heaven in no way regards you as a man who has betrayed his Lord. Moreover, your small village has been heavily taxed and its people have repeatedly been forced, put to forced labor until you yourself have no horse to ride and your wife and children lack for clothing. Yet despite your own poverty, you felt sympathy for the votary of the Lotus Sutra, thinking that he must be beleaguered by snow in the depths of the mountains and in want of food. So you have sent me one can of coins. Your offering is like that of the poor woman who gave to a beggar the single cloak that she and her husband shared. Or like that of Rida, who gave the millet in his jar to a Pratyaka Buddha. How admirable! I will tell you more later in detail. With my deep respect, Nichiren. Thank you. <coughs> so, in studying this Gosho, it's particularly important we go back to that second paragraph that we mentioned earlier. And I'm going to ask Bill to read it again because this is really the heart of this Gosho and the tales that follow are purely and simply to illustrate the points which Nitschen Daishonin makes in that second paragraph. So could you read it again, Bill? <coughs> there is a way to become a Buddha easily and I will teach it to you. To teach another something is like oiling the wheels of a heavy cart so that they will turn, or like floating a boat upon the water so that it may move ahead without difficulty. The way to become a Buddha easily is nothing extraordinary. It is, for example, to give water to a thirsty person in time of drought, or to provide fire for someone freezing in the cold, or again, it's to give another something irreplaceable. When one's own life is about to be extinguished from want of it, one gives it as arms to another person. So I hope it's clear that, of course, although these stories are all based on the old principle of almsgiving, uh, in these modern <coughs> times of welfare states and so on, almsgivings aren't uh, a, a necessary uh, thing. But uh, that is only the surface meaning of Nichiren Daishonin, including these stories. Uh, what he is talking about is giving someone something so valuable that they can overcome their suffering. And that, of course, can be giving them the key to discovering their Buddhahood. In other words, in the end, uh, this is a matter of uh, spiritual life, not just uh, material life. So at this point, let's become clear. Why are we practicing? There are some hundreds of us here in this hall tonight. Why are we practicing? So we may have all sorts of different thoughts in answering that question. But the fundamental, basic answer must be to attain Buddhahood. Because that ultimately is the whole purpose of this practice. This is why Nichiren Daishonin spent a lifetime teaching and was preceded by many other Buddhas who spent lifetimes teaching as they developed uh, over the ages and brought the teachings down to this day. We are practicing for no other reason whatsoever than attaining Buddhahood, which is the ultimate life state of fulfillment and happiness <coughs> in this lifetime. And through this, not only totally transforming our own lives, but through helping others also to understand the way in which they can manifest their highest state of life, their Buddhahood, we can also bring about a change in our environment 
ultimately in society as a whole and ultimately, of course, bring about a change in the entire world. So this was the emphasis of all Nichiren Daishonin's teachings. Of course, it's not expected that everyone will be open to be taught, and indeed, one finds they're not. Some way their lives must be ripe and ready to be taught. And it is then uh, that we can begin to teach the practice for both ourselves and others in perfect balance, which is the basis on which Nichiren Daishonin's teachings uh, have been handed down over many generations. The practice is one of practice for yourself and practice for others. And not only did Nichiren Daishonin teach this, but also Shakyamuni, 2,000 years before Nichiren Daishonin, taught the same principle. The principle uh, that those in his vision of the future, those bodhisattvas who would arise from the earth, would teach the Lotus Sutra to others, as well as uh, giving an example of its benefits to others through their own experiences and lives. So, of course, as we see the Buddha nature at work to an increasing extent, we do reap amazing benefits. I don't suppose there is one person practicing in this room for more than a week or two or three, or perhaps a month or two or three, who can't give experience of an amazing number of benefits to their lives. This is inevitable. It's inevitable because the very practice of chanting nam myoho kyo is activating our Buddha state. Indeed, Nichiren Daishonin said we can't even chant nam myoho kyo without being in the Buddha state. Though, of course, our conscious minds can't understand that. But in fact, to chant those words, we are already in the Buddha state. So the whole process of this teaching, these teachings, is to bring one to understand consciously that that is what has taken place in one's life. And once that is clear, to be able to use those qualities of Buddhahood freely in exactly the best way to create value uh, around oneself in every aspect of the environment. If we practice for ourselves, however, and we practice only for the benefits, and this becomes an obsession, and we fail to practice for others, then that is not what Nichiren Daishonin or any other Buddha aimed at at all. And what is more, it won't work for very long because we will find our lives become stagnant and heavy, even though we seem to be doing our individual practice so strongly. It certainly wasn't Nichiren Daishonin's intention that we should become so obsessed with benefit for ourselves. If you like, hooked on benefits. or even, in the end, drunk with benefits, stupid with benefits. That was not the purpose of his practice. But, of course, the benefits do come. Therefore, unless one's view of this practice is very broad and very clear, we can very easily fall into the trap of practicing for benefits and becoming obsessed with this way. Always in front of one's gohonzon, during gongyo, during daimoku, in one's thoughts, thinking only of benefits for me, and perhaps leaving a few little pathetic, weak daimoku <laughs> for others, just like as a matter of principle. 
So, <laughs> you may laugh, <laughs> but how many of you have fallen into that trap from time to time? How many of you may be in it now? I don't think many in this hall. But I do think there are quite a number of members in Ennis UK who have fallen into that trap. And I think the time has come now to face this very clearly and frankly. For example, why is it that we have earned in some particular sorts of newspapers and magazines the title Designer Buddhists? We see it a lot. Why? We didn't invent it. This is something which a journalist at some time uh, jumped to a conclusion about. And most likely he jumped to that conclusion when he was at a discussion meeting. Because all he heard about possibly at that discussion meeting, was experiences about conspicuous benefits, personal conspicuous benefits. But that is not what Nichiren Daishonin's teachings are all about, as we're already, uh, I think, agreeing. So, of course, probably at those meetings, at the meeting that that journalist went to, Someone may have sprung forward, as I know they do from time to time, and tried to save the day, realizing that all the experiences have been about material benefits or conspicuous benefits, and they try to point out that, of course, in the end, if you chant to the Gohonzon, inevitably, because your Buddha nature is being activated, at last you see the error of, the w of your ways and you understand that material benefits are not what is going to bring you ultimate happiness. And that what is going to give you ultimate happiness is to conquer something much deeper like unreasonable fear or anger or whatever, or even plain stupidity that exists in one's life. In other words, the human revolution. So, uh, our journalist, by this time, of course, has already closed up his or her ears. They've got their headline, Designer Buddhist. And they're busily, mentally, in the midst of the meeting, working out their article. They're not listening to what that other person was saying after. It's too late. So I'm afraid too many of us have fallen into this trap. And even though we may not be practicing in that way for ourselves alone, somehow or other at the discussion meetings or when we're talking people, we are giving the impression that what this practice is about is material benefit conspicuous material benefit. Must be so. If we think about it, I'm sure we begin to realize this is so. What has made us do it? That's the interesting point. What has made us do it? I think it's some sort of feeling that you have to market this Buddhism. You've got to sell it in some way. And if you sell it or market it in a way uh, which is probably the most popular in a materialistic society, then what you should be talking about is benefit. Don't you think this may possibly be what brings us to do this at times? But I believe we're totally underestimating those people to whom we're talking in a good many of the cases. People uh, don't want to hear uh, about 
the latest benefit, and anyway, probably they don't particularly believe it. What they would respond to is an incredible experience about how this or that person is fighting to overcome, say, greed or anger, unreasonable anger, violence, or whatever it may be. That is what moves someone, don't you think, immensely. It may be a negative experience. The person may be only just at the beginning of this battle inside themselves. But it can be immensely stirring because every other human being has got some hang-up inside them. There isn't one that's not suffering in some way from the power of the negative force that exists in everyone's life. That is what moves people. And of course, uh, the other thing that moves people is the sound of someone who is actually concerned deeply about the sufferings of other people, let alone themselves. Perhaps nothing on earth can be more moving than someone who is struggling with this battle inside them to overcome their own sufferings and at the same time is trying to give to the best of their ability to others in the same way as Nanjo Tokimitsu. In the midst of his sufferings, of course they were of a different nature in those days, but how he gave to Nichiren and Daishonin regularly, no matter what. So it seems to me uh, that this sort of situation has led to much misunderstanding about this Buddhism. And of course, please understand, there are many of you here who probably have never uh, fallen into this trap. On the other hand, some of us have. And I am sure, in time, over the years, that's included me from time to time too. So, uh, we cannot go on underestimating our guests in this way. So we are moving in a to, to a totally new era now. We've only got to watch the television or read the newspapers every day to become very aware of this. What is it? Why is it that people, the people, have stood up as they have all over the world in order to defeat oppression and unhappiness which has afflicted their lives for so long. For 50 years and more, suddenly people everywhere are standing up. People who are showing courage. People who are showing outrage at things that are wrong in this world. I'm sure you agree with me. Such people, the people of the 90s, don't need any namby-pamby sort of approach when we're trying to teach them about Buddhism. When we're trying to teach them about the movement of Kosunrufu, which is one of them, not one of, which is the most incredible human movement that has ever been seen and it spans the whole world with more than 20 million people. We no need to cover things up, to make things sound easier. The people, I believe, of the 90s want the challenge. They want to see how they can contribute to this world in the same way as they see their fellow human beings doing so in countries which have been particularly oppressed or particularly miserable in these past years. This is the spirit of the 90s and it's the spirit of the 21st century that we're seeing. And what is more, of course, it's a time when great people, great people who have the courage to challenge their human revolution, great people who have that courage to dedicate themselves to a movement, a movement to help other human beings overcome their sufferings, this is the time when people are also needed, people who have wisdom as well as courage and who have compassion as well as energy. 
Because what we see going on is only at its very beginning. The walls have come down physically in so many places in these last few months even. But the walls in human beings' hearts have not come down yet. Circumstances can change and the old barriers, the old negative tendency of human beings can easily rise up again. Now more than ever we need people who are challenging that negativity that exists in them. And there is no better way, there is no surer way than chanting nam myoho renge kyo than activating your Buddha state, than attaining Buddhahood just as an ordinary person like me or you in this lifetime. That I'm, I feel so convinced. The time is here now. The time is to give everyone a challenge. And people are waiting to take it. So I really ask you all today to ponder very deeply what I have said it is nothing new. It's emphasized in every writing of Nichiren Daishun. What is the way of this practice? But we've tended, for one reason or another, to gloss it over sometimes, to make it seem more simple, to make it seem, in other words, even self-centered. The time is past for that. Let's establish incredible discussion meetings where what people hear about is their human revolution, how they're challenging things. It doesn't matter if they haven't won yet. The great thing is they're doing it. And what made them do it? Why they're doing it? This is what people <coughs> wish to hear. And a dedicated spirit towards Kosen Rufu. Everyone to be King Konjikis or Queen Konjikis or everyone to be Mr. and Mrs. Sudatas. People who will take up the challenge and dedicate their lives to a great, incredible human movement. So, uh, last May, all of you, most if I may say so, magnificently, were at the starting line when President Decatur visited this country for the first time for 14 years. Your response, the way you supported all the activities of that uh, amazing two weeks, the fact that you were there, full of daimoku and faith and on your toes, was a most wonderful thing. We weren't lagging behind. We were ready to go. And uh, the signal and direction we should go, I believe, has come clear to us now. So as you know, uh, Sensei is hoping to come again in the spring of next year, 1991. Not just hoping, but he's determined he's going to come. So I think we know what we've got to do between now and then. To start a fresh advance, an advance which is really suited to the 90s, which is not suited to the 80s or the 70s or the 60s, now long behind us, but for the 90s. A challenging movement in which uh, we don't mince matters. Everyone is clear what it means to be a follower of Nichiren Daishonin and what it means to be working for Kosen Rufu. Then I'm sure we shall be able to pass the first milestone of our advance towards the 21st century, which will be when President Ikeda comes that next year. And by then, every member, every new member, Everyone who is practicing without the Gohonsen and waiting for Gojukai, even those who have only attended two or three meetings will be very clear, I pray, through your great efforts, what it is that this practice involves and what joy 
we can get from entering into it wholeheartedly wholeheartedly in that practice for ourselves and practice for others in the knowledge that with that balance everything that we need for our happiness will come there are people sitting here who I've known for a number of years who uh, can support totally that fact giving your life and then everything you need comes that is the way of the law of cause and effect. It isn't the way a Buddha invented. It is a very natural law of life. So I really thank you for listening patiently. Uh, and I thank you too for giving me the opportunity of expressing my feelings. I hope I haven't battered too many ears. And I hope uh, that many of you can already feel this must be the right way for the future. Thank you very much indeed.